The Gospel of Matthew Jesus and the Children Matthew 18, 1-14 Introduction 1. One of the more touching and endearing scenes during the life of Jesus was when he used a little child to teach his disciples some lessons. Matthew 18, 1-14 2. For all who would be true disciples of Jesus, there are valuable lessons to be gleaned from this passage. In that hour the disciples came to Jesus, saying, Who then is greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Jesus called a little child to himself, and set him in the midst of them, and said, Most assuredly I tell you, unless you turn, and become as little children, you will in no way enter into the kingdom of heaven. Whoever therefore humbles himself as this little child, the same as the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Matthew 18, 1-4 1. The Necessity of Conversion a. Without conversion, there is no salvation. 1. Unless you are converted, Jesus said. a. You will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. b. Without conversion, we cannot have our sins blotted out. Acts 3.19 c. And we will not enjoy times of refreshing from the Lord. Acts 3.19 2. Note that the process of conversion is passive, be converted. a. It is something you must allow to be done to you. b. It begins when we in faith submit to the working of God. 1. That is, in baptism. Colossians 2.12 2. Wherein by God's mercy we experience regeneration, renewal. Titus 3, 5. C. It continues as we live the Christian life. 1. God continues his working in us. Philippians 1, 6. 2, 12 13. 2. He will do so until the coming of Christ. 1 Thessalonians 5, 23 24 of you, indeed are you, submitting to the working of God in your life so as to be truly converted? b. A conversion involving childlike humility. 1. This was the concern of Jesus in Matthew 18, 4. a. For his disciples had asked who would be greatest in the kingdom. b. Jesus used a child to illustrate the sort of humility one must have. 2. Paul later used Jesus as an example of humility. Philippians 2, 3-5 Those who submit to the working of God in their lives will produce this kind of humility necessary for salvation. Colossians 3:12-13. Whoever receives one such little child in my name receives me, but whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to stumble. It would be better for him that a huge millstone should be hung around his neck, and that he should be sunk in the depths of the sea. Woe to the world because of occasions of stumbling. For it must be that the occasions come, but woe to that person through whom the occasion comes. Matthew 18, 5-7 2 The sin of stumbling blocks A. Who are the children? 1. Some think Jesus used an infant to make his point about humility, and is now discussing his adult disciples. 2. But the Greek word for child, paedian, can refer to one as old as 12 years. Mark 5.39-42 I understand Jesus to be discussing children old enough to believe, old enough to sin. Matthew 18, 6. B. The terribleness of causing children to sin. 1. It would be better to be killed by drowning. Matthew 18, 6. 2. Woe to that man. Matthew 18, 7. 3. Why so terrible? Because it is a sin against Christ himself. A. Note Matthew 18, 5. And consider its opposite. B. Paul learned this lesson on the road to Damascus. Acts 9, 4-5 C. 
he taught this truth to brethren in Corinth. 1 Corinthians 8, 9-13 C. How one can put stumbling blocks in a child's way. 1. By doing anything to keep them from serving Christ freely. 2. Directly, by persecuting, ridiculing, opposing, or dissuading them from serving the Lord. 3. Indirectly, by living a life inconsistent with what we claim to be. Are we putting stumbling blocks before our children, even unwittingly? If your hand or your foot causes you to stumble, cut it off, and cast it from you. It is better for you to enter into life maimed or crippled, rather than having two hands or two feet to be cast into the eternal fire. If your eye causes you to stumble, pluck it out, and cast it from you. It is better for you to enter into life with one eye, rather than having two eyes to be cast into the Gehenna of fire. Matthew 18, 8-9 3 The Reality of Future Punishment A. Some deny punishment after death, but not Jesus. 1. Seventh-day Adventists and members of the Watchtower Society JWs. 2. Yet Jesus, more than any other, taught the reality of an eternal, suffering place of torment. A. The word Gehenna is used twelve times in Scripture, all but once by Jesus. B. Elsewhere he mentions everlasting fire and everlasting punishment. Matthew 25, 41 and 46. C. And so did his disciples. Hebrews 10 26-29 Revelation 21, 8, 3 Consider the implication of Matthew 18, 6 and Hebrews 10 28-29 A. What could be worse than drowning in the sea or dying without mercy? B. According to those who deny punishment after death, nothing. Dare we water down what Jesus and the Bible teaches about the destiny of the wicked? B. We should therefore take sin seriously. 1. So much so, that we remove whatever is close and dear to us if it causes us to sin. 2. Jesus is using hyperbole, of course, for what good would it be to pluck out only one eye? Sin is like cancer. Sometimes radical surgery is the only solution. See that you don't despise one of these little ones, for I tell you that in heaven their angels always see the face of my Father who is in heaven. For the Son of Man came to save that which was lost. What do you think? If a man has one hundred sheep, and one of them goes astray, doesn't he leave the ninety-nine, go to the mountains, and seek that which has gone astray? If he finds it, most assuredly I tell you, he rejoices over it more than over the ninety-nine which have not gone astray. Even so it is not the will of your Father who is in heaven that one of these little ones should perish. Matthew 18 10-14 4 The preciousness of God's children A. Their angels always behold God's face. 1. What this may involve, one can only speculate. A. Many think this refers to guardian angels. Stamas 91, 9-12. B. We do know that angels are ministering spirits sent forth to minister for those who will inherit salvation. Hebrews 1, 14. 2. Our text speaks of their presence before God. Matthew 18, 10. A which some take to refer to their readiness to carry out the Father's wishes. Matthew Henry, Adam Clark B. At the very least we know there is joy in their presence when sinners repent. Luke 15.10 C. Will they not be dismayed when one of God's children sin, or is made to stumble by others? Their close proximity to God in heaven suggests the honor God has toward those children who believe. B. The Son of Man came to save them. 1. Jesus came to die for them. 2. Matthew 18:11. 2. 
Jesus illustrated his concern for them with the parable of the lost sheep. Matthew 18 12-13 If Jesus was willing to give his life for them, dare we despise or neglect them? See, the Father doesn't want to lose even one. 1. It is not his will. Matthew 18 14 2. Notice, he does not want to lose one of these little ones. If both the Father and Son think so highly of these little ones, should not we? Conclusion 1. The words of Jesus should motivate us to take children seriously. A. For parents, how important to bring your child up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. B. For teachers, how serious and noble is your task of teaching our children. C. For all of us, we are examples and role models, whether good or bad, and God will hold us accountable for the effect we have on them. 2. And for those who would enter the kingdom. A. Heed the necessity of being converted. B. Let the example of childlike trust and humility be a guide as to how we should serve God and one another. Have you humbled yourself in obedience to the gospel of Jesus Christ? The end. The gospel of Matthew. Jesus and the children. Matthew 18, 1-14.